real no. dragon is in you. And what is that real dragon? That's your ego holding you in. What's my ego? What I want, what I believe, what I can do, what I uh, think I love, and all that. What I regard as the aim of my life and so forth. It might be too small. It might be that which pins you down. And if it's simply that of doing what the environment tells you to do, it certainly is pinning you down. And so the environment is your dragon as it reflects within yourself. Hello again, everybody. This is Robert P. Fitton speaking to you in the dead of winter. I've been working on a long novel called Sojourn, getting the audio together and just about completing it. Then I will go back, edit, and it should be available for sale sometime in March. This uh, long novel does have a point to it, believe it or not, besides all the action that's involved in it, and a lot of it is psychological. We're going to be talking about the persona of the main character in the book. Now, we all have personas, myself included. Loftus has a persona that's dictated to him at a very early age. One of the things this novel demonstrates is being caught up in a persona to the extent that is all you are. You become that persona. We'll see as this book evolves, that's what happens to Loftus. I'm going to play a cut from the first chapter, which begins the turmoil for Tom Loftus way back when he was just a little kid, except he's not on the planet Earth. This is the beginning of the evolution of his persona, Chapter 1, from Sojourn. The inner vengeance spread over Altashar like a severin death claw devouring life. Trevor held his father's strong, calloused hand and followed the montane down the rock terrace mountain trail. Black smoke trails flumed toward the gray clouds above. The silver cluster ships had spun out of the vermilion skies with a gruesome energy attack on the village, convincing Trebor that the Montank survivors would stay on the run. He had only seen a few huge green corpses strewn across the river sands. His father called them Creods. They towered over the Montang, had thin bodies and heads larger than the Montang foodstuff bags. Yellow crusted blood leaked from their open wounds, and pink fangs framed their little mouths. The blue black mesh eyes bore a little resemblance to his smaller Altasharian eyes. Trevor longed for the world before the cluster attacks. The advanced scout leaped over the trail rocks, and the Montank stopped. It is written that the inner vengeance dwells within the Creod race. It is an evil that advances to destroy the Mantari. They behead the conquered and keep their skulls in cluster ships. How can we stop them? cried Sator. By resonating to oneness. Only by becoming one through Tabun Shah can we destroy the interventions. We must flee the mountains from them. We cannot leave the mountains, said the scout. Sator held his shoulders. Why not? The cluster ships occupy the skies and cover the land all the way to Tarsan City. There is no way to cross without being seen. Many Montang members voiced sadness at the news. Too many Altasharians were already dead. His father said they had joined with Tarbun Shah. Trevor's own mother and sister ran from the attack last week. The scout yelled over their chatter. Wait! Wait! We have another course. We do. We follow the ancient legends. Listen to what the learned ones have taught us and find Tabun Shah. We may be the last of the Altasharian people. Tabun Shah is the last hope for all, Mantari. Trevor's father stepped forth from the confusion. The scout is right. It is said that the shrine of Tabun Shah contains the passageway to other worlds. That is only a legend, said a little man named Aok from across the circle. One of the white-bearded learned ones held up a worn and faded red book. The Montang fell to the ground as he lowered the book and opened it slowly in dusk's orange light. 
Trevor tried to hear his weak voice. The Tabun Shah ruled the Mantari, our sacred people. Hear the word of Tabun Shah. We have left our mark. The Bunshaf stretches to the sky. It is clear. The haven, a respite from the inner vengeance. It is the door to other worlds and forever. Where the Carpen meets the Beverlton above the Sempa, the way is set forth to the circle of one. Trust your convictions, and the passage shall be made clear. The way of Tabun Shah. Thunder again rumbled down the canyon. Trevor scrambled behind the rocks and blocked his ears as green flashes lit the clouds. The first blast was muffled and far away, yet the ground slowly shook. His father's arm locked around his back as pebbles and sand trickled down the cliffs. The mountains protected the Montang from the cluster probes. The Creods could not attack as long as the Montang hid below the rock ledges. The battle was distant as the afternoon light darkened. Occasional blasts soon faded and the frightening flashes stopped. The Montang stayed under the ledge until the cluster ships were gone. Trevor's father hoisted him into the evening air. He raised his arm and spoke loudly. You heard the learned one between the Carpen and the Beverilton. The two most prominent sky features and seen only in the upper part of our planet. Meeting at the portion of the sky directly overhead, the Semta. Trevor let his inner soul be taken by the truth as he resonated to the oneness of Tabun Shah. Yet his head sensed the need to find the shrine and escape the Creod invaders. He resonated deeply and fell with the others to the ground. Loftus could not halt his mind's journey away from the wavery white light. Phil snapped his fingers and shook his shoulders. A befuddled look swept across his balding friend's thin face. After ten sessions under deep hypnosis, Phil should have already deciphered this Creod stuff. A few years back, I found a very entertaining as well as informative group of podcasts from John Betts, who is a Jungian psychologist up in Vancouver, British Columbia. Betts really can zero in on this persona aspect a lot better than I can. I can write about it, I can demonstrate it with Loftus, but here is John Betts talking about just what persona is in somebody's personality. Hence, persona refers to the mask or face a person puts on to confront the world. Persona can refer to gender identity or a stage of development such as adolescence, a social status, a job or profession. Over a lifetime, many personas will be worn and several may be combined at any one moment." End quote. Now what exactly does this mean to you and I? Well, we all have at least one persona. More likely, we have far more than that. Often our persona is based on something we do or are expected to do in society, such as being an employee or a lawyer or a supporter of a football team. When we are in this role, we tend to act in ways that are consistent with how we expect others to view us. So, as the lawyer, we may always try to be erudite or wise. As a football team supporter, we wear particular team colors, assemble with other supporters, and are often loud in public. All the time, we're acting out a persona. I find it useful to pay attention to not only what we are doing in terms of our behavior, but also what clothes we wear, how we speak, and especially what we actually say and think. Now we're going to go a couple of chapters ahead and get a cut from Loftus, talking to his psychiatrist, his old friend, and he's going to get a mouthful from Phil of exactly what his problem is, because he really can't see it. But Phil can see it, and he tells him point blank, just what his persona is all about. He looked up at Phil. When I was a boy, I'd hear a baseball announcer in my mind as I stepped up to the plate. 
The pitch came in and I connected like I had never connected. You know, the sound of wood against the bat. And I kept hearing the play-by-play. -play. That ball is going, going, gone. Phil rolled his eyes. The hero. You and the service were just made for each other. What do you mean? You want to be the hero. Phil stood and started to put down the money for the check, but Loftus pushed his hand back. Don't worry about it, Phil. Tom, there's nothing bad about being the hero unless you're not being the hero. Loftus rubbed his face. Listen, it's okay to be the hero if that's what you enjoy doing. Where we run into trouble, Loftus, is getting caught up in things we kind of want to do and don't want to do at all. Yeah, I kind of like having the loft. Phil grinned. He had a space between his two front teeth. Picture a Ferris wheel, spinning upward as we strive or we may even make it to the top. The question is whether we want to be on that ride or do we want to be in the center. I don't understand that at all. In the center, there's no mess. It's balancing yourself rather than letting what you're doing get out of whack. And how do I find that out? I can't tell you that. Only you know. Like the baseball going over the fence? You make it sound like destiny. That is exactly what it is. Tom Loftus's persona overtakes him. Now here is the master himself, Carl Jung, speaking about persona. If you would uh, mind telling us a little bit about how you uh, construe this term persona. Uh, well, this is a, a practical concept we need uh, in elucidating people's relation. Um, I noticed uh, with my uh, uh, patients, particularly with uh, people that are in, uh, in public life, that they have a certain way of uh, presenting themselves. Uh, for instance, take the doctor. He uh, has a, a certain way, for instance, he has good bedside manners, and, and uh, uh, he behaves as one as expects a doctor behaves. He may even identify himself with it and, uh, and believe that he is what he appears to be. Yeah. Uh, he must appear in, in a certain form, unless uh, people don't believe that he's a doctor. And so when he's a professor, he's also supposed to behave in a certain way, so that it is plausible that he is a professor, you know. So the persona is partially uh, the result of the demands society has. And on the other side, it is a, a, a compromise with what one likes to be, or with what, or as one likes to appear, uh -huh. say. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, take, for instance, uh, a parson. He also has his particular manner, and uh, as uh, corresponding to the general expectation, and uh, he behaves also in, in, in another way, uh, combined with his per persona, that is forced upon him by society in such a way that also his fiction of himself, his idea about himself, uh, is more or less uh, portrayed or uh, represented. Uh, so the persona is a certain, certain complicated system of behavior which is partially dictated by society and partially dictated by the expectations or the wishes uh, one nurses oneself. Yes. Uh, now, this is not the real personality, in spite of the fact that people will assure you that it is, that is all quite real and uh, quite honest, yet it is not. Yes. Now, uh, such a uh, performance or, uh, say, yeah, the, the performance of the, uh, of the persona uh, is quite all right as long as you know that you are not identical with the way in which you appear. Yeah. But uh, if you are unconscious of this fact, then you uh, get into uh, sometimes very disagreeable conflicts, namely people will, uh, can't help noticing that 
at home, for instance, you are quite different from what you appear to be in public. Yeah. And people who don't know it uh, stumble over it in the end. Uh, they deny that they are like that, but they are like that. They yeah. are it. And then you don't know, now, which is the real man? Yes. Yeah. Is he the man as he is at home or in intimate relations, or is he uh, the man that appears in public? It is a question of Jekyll and Hyde. Yes. Often. And I think it's a question we have to ultimately ask ourselves, you know, who exactly are we, where we're going, what we want to do. This is Robert P. Fitton, and I've been zooming up and down, over and out, and down and in. Back into the past, ahead into the future. Check out Fitton's Time Travel and all Fitton books at audible.com.